Well, good morning. I'm glad you're here. Are you glad you're here? Yes. Good, good, good. This crowd right here, very enthusiastic. So I might find myself kind of gravitating in their direction if I will go south here in just a minute. But, uh, I am glad you're here. Give me just a few minutes of your time. Uh, I want to continue a sermon that I started two Sundays ago. Actually, may in hindsight be a sermon series, a brief one, but it's entitled Bought In or Bought Off. And in the first sermon, I ask you a question Are you bought in? And I know what you're wondering, and that is to what? I'm asking you if you have bought in to a lifestyle of obedience to God. Now, to help you answer that question, we profiled a man named Balaam. And a portion of his story is found in the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 22, 23, and 24. And having profiled him, we came to the conclusion that guy was bought in. In three chapters, five times, he said publicly, I will only do what God leads me to do. I will only say what God tells me to say. In other words, I'm going to obey God, period. Now, from his life, we identified what I feel like were the three characteristics of a person who has really bought in. Characteristic number one, they habitually meet with, consult with, and listen to God. Five times, Scott. Five times in three chapters, the man had a decision to make and said, hold on, here we go, I got to pull back, talk with God. Before I commit to any course of action, I got to know what he wants me to do. I think that's typical of those who are bought in because after all, if you're bought into a lifestyle of obedience, how do you do what God wants you to do if you don't know what he wants you to do? Hence the need to pull away on a regular basis, proactively seeking the, the mind of God and the leadership of God in your life. But there was a second characteristic. People who are bought in do what God wants them to do no matter what. I mean, Balaam was like... If I do what God has told me to do, then it's going to cost me a lot of money. I don't care. That's fine. Going to put me at great risk. Don't care about that either. Going to be unpopular with my peers. Don't care. All that, I, all that I'm concerned about here is that this is what God wants me to do. I think that's a characteristic of, of people who are bought in. They do what God wants them to do no matter what cost, risk popular, don't care, it's what God wants, that's all that matters to me. But the third characteristic I thought was really interesting, people who are bought in, they're not perfect. Not perfect. Balaam was anything but perfect. However, he was evolving. There were some things I felt like he was growing out of. But when he did wrong, and everybody, I don't care if you bought in, nobody gets it right every time. But when Balaam didn't get it right, he was remorseful and he was repentant. And I think those are the characteristics of a person who's bought in. They habitually meet with God because they're constantly wanting to know what do you want me to do here. They do what he wants them to do no matter what. And, and when they don't get it right, they're remorseful. They lose sleep over it until they can make that thing right with God and get back on track in their lives. And I ask you this question, is that you? And some of you humbly, honestly, answered that question in your mind, and you went, yeah, that's, that's the way I try to do this, Ronnie. I really try to live life that way. Others, you were honest with yourself, and as a matter of fact, you kind of look back over your life, and you're going, ah, Ronnie, I wish I could say, yes, that's me, I'm bought in, but I, I just don't know. I mean, days go by sometimes, sometimes weeks, and I never really stop to wonder, what does God want me to do? 
And Ronnie, if I knew what he wanted me to do, and I knew that if I do this, it's going to cost me, or it's going to put me at risk, i got to be frank with you, I'm probably not going to do that. If i got to choose between obedience to God and popularity with my peers, Ronnie, I'm probably going to choose popularity every time. And so I think the conclusion you may have reached is, I'm not bought in. And here was my question. If you're not bought in, why not? Every one of us knows that it's what God wants. I mean, when we were saved, we not only received Jesus as our Savior, we, we confessed Him as our Lord. In other words, we put Him in the position of authority over our lives. He's the boss now. What do, you think, what do you think he wants? He wants us to do what he wants us to do. We know it's the way it ought to be. We know it's wise on our part because Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, you want to know the secret to life as it should be lived. He said, fear God and obey him. You know, fear God and do whatever he tells you to do. That's the rule of life. And, and it's an essential. When you and I were saved, God planned to change us and change us in very positive and dramatic ways. And to be changed, you know what you and I have to do? We've got to obey. But he also planned to use us to change others. And if that's going to happen, here's an essential. You and I have to obey. So if it's what God wants and it's wise and it's essential, here's my question. If you're not bought in, why not? Could it be that you've been bought off? Now, for those of you who weren't here two weeks ago, uh, I want you to understand that as Balaam is committed to this lifestyle of obedience, at least for this chapter of his life, there was a guy named Balak who was constantly trying to buy him off. Balak was the king of Moab, and he was threatened because the Israelites, the people of God, had camped near his kingdom. And so he was trying to hire Balaam to put a curse on the Israelites so that hopefully he could weaken them to the point that he could overpower them. And Balaam knew that would be an act of disobedience, right? We, re- we saw that two weeks ago. But Balak pressures him, I believe, four times in three chapters Balak offered Balaam a lot of money. If you will just disobey God, I'll make it worth your while. But we came to the conclusion of chapter number 24, and it appeared that Balaam stood strong. He was resolute. He refused to be bought off. He insisted on staying bought in. When we come to the end of chapter 24 of the book of Numbers, Balak looked at Balaam and said, you're fired. Balaam looked back at him and said, don't worry about it, I quit. And apparently the two men parted company. Or did they? I want us to read some verses from the New Testament this morning about the hero of our story, Balaam. The first is found in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. Before we read it, let me set the stage and tell you what's going on. The Apostle Peter is writing to Christian people. And he's warning them about false teachers. Men and women who would manipulate the Scriptures to make them say what they wanted them to say for personal gain. And so in the context of these warnings, listen to what Peter said. He said, they, speaking of these false teachers, have wandered off the right road... And followed the footsteps of Balaam, son of Beor. Same Balaam. Same dude. Look how he described him. Who loved to earn money by doing right. And what it says is it? What does it say about old Balaam? He loved to earn money. By doing wrong? 
Look at Jude, verse 11. Jude only, the book of Jude only has one chapter. And once again, Jude, is, he's doing the same thing. The, the apostle Peter, he's warning Christians about false teachers. Look what he said. What sorrow awaits them. For they follow in the footsteps of Cain who killed his brother. You familiar with that story of the book of Genesis? And look what he says. Like Balaam. Huh? They deceive people for money. And like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. Huh. That's interesting to me. Because we, we, we left a hero two weeks ago. We left, and he was a hero in our eyes. We wanted to emulate him in our commitment to God and obedience to God. What is this? Let's read one more. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Jesus has dictated a letter to a church. And in a portion of the letter, he's, ta- he's commending them. You know, I, I commend you for this and that and that. And then all of a sudden, he changes. He said, but I've got a few complaints I'd like to register about you. Look what Jesus said to this church. He said, but I have a few complaints against you. You, you tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam. who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. Jesus said he did it. Jesus said. Balaam did show Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. All right, now, we can't ignore this. These verses are in our Bible, as well as the story I told you two weeks ago. How do we reconcile these verses with Numbers 24, 25 that leads us to believe that Balaam refused to be bought off? Was that the end of the story? No. Unfortunately, Balaam's story continues. Uh, To to get a a complete understanding of Balaam's story, we would have to read chapters 25 through 31 of the book of Numbers. Do you want me to just start in, commence reading that to you right now? Uh Listen, I had three cups of coffee this morning instead of two. I can read it, preach it, run backwards while I'm doing it. It don't matter to me. I'm kind of hopped up. I think I've overdosed on caffeine. Let me tell you what happened. So you come to the end of 24, Balak goes one way, Balaam goes the other. You start reading in chapter 25, and the Bible said that Moabite women and Midianite women, these women from the two countries that were trying to convince Balaam to curse Israel, they began to go down and visit the Israelite camp. And they began to seduce Israelite men. And some of these Israelite men couldn't resist their seduction. And they started having sex with these women. Okay, we're about to get PG-13, right? You ready? You prepared for that? Some of these men, some of these start having sex with these women. You say 4, 5, 15, 20? Mm-mm. Hundreds. Thousands. I'm sure some of these men were single and they were, here's a word you don't hear much these days, but it, it's in the Bible, fornicating. They were having sex outside of marriage, sin. They were sinning with these women. A lot of these men were married, yet they were sleeping with these women. Adultery. So you've got thousands of Israelite men who are now committing sin, uh, sexual sin. That wasn't the worst part. These women used sex as leverage to convince these men who knew and belonged to the true God that you ought to come up to our temple and worship our God with us. 
Now, you know men. Huh? I'm not going to say much more than that. You know men. What do you think these guys did? These jack legs <laughs> went right up to the temple of these false gods. And they worshipped a pagan god named Baal instead of their god. Why? The promise of more sex. They ate food that was offered to idols, sin. They worshipped a false god, sin. They were committing fornication and adultery, sin. How do you think God responded to this? Do you think he was hurt? No. Frustrated with them? No. Aggravated? I can't believe it. No. You know what the Bible said? That his anger blazed against them. Ah, that scares me. His anger, he wasn't just angry at these men. His anger blazed at them. He was furious with these men. So I'll tell you what he did. He sent a plague among them. And, and, and these men who were sleeping with these women and worshiping false God and eating food, off, they just started dying. Because God was killing them. You say, to get 10, 12 of them before they kind of wised up? Oh, no. You do know men, don't you? You do understand men? Huh? Men were dying by the hundreds. And yet, the other men were not deterred. So men started dying by the thousands. Men. Come on, guys. We need to snap out of it. Huh? Well, they have a big meeting. God called the meeting, brought Moses and the leaders there, and he said, here's what we're going to have to do. I want you to publicly execute the, ring, the men who are the ringleaders in this. The townspeople were broken. Families were broken. People were weeping. They were in a state of shock. And while they're having this meeting, and, and they're, you know, they're, going, they're realizing that, that things are about to get worse, and you know, they're upset over the conduct of these men, and the Bible said that it would be just it, like a meeting like this. They're having a meeting, and along comes this Israelite man. His name was Zimri. And on his arm, he had a Midianite woman named Cosby. They walk right by Moses, the priest, the broken people, the grieving widows and mothers, they walk right past them, arm in arm, and everybody there knew what they're going to do. You talk about brazen. Zimri goes to his tent and takes this woman inside. Now, guys, it'd be like us showing up this afternoon to our home with another woman and saying, Honey, just, if you'll excuse us, we need the bedroom. Huh? It'd be like stopping this meeting. And, and that, I mean, they were in a state of shock. There was a dude there named Phineas. He had it. He had all he could take of this. He was angry. You know why? He felt that man insulted his God. Phineas grabbed his spear walked down to Zimri's tent, opened the door and walked in and found Zimri and Cosby. I'm trying to be discreet, but they didn't waste any time getting around to what they had planned. Do you, do you get, are you getting my drift without drawing a picture, huh? Yeah. Phineas took his spear, shoved it through Zimri and through Cosby, pinning them to the floor and killing them both. You know what God said? Well done. End of plague. 
well done. Somebody, somebody respected my holiness. Well, but by this time, you know how many Israelite men were now dead from the plague? You know how many? 2,400. Now think about this, 2,400 capable soldiers now taking, taken out of the equation. Isn't that what Balak wanted from the beginning? Do you find it ironic that what Israel's enemies couldn't do to them, they've now done to themselves? God spoke to Moses and said, here's what you're going to do. Get your army together. We're going to go attack Midian. I don't know why not Moab. Got an idea, but it's hodgeology, so I'll just keep that to myself. You got it? He said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go attack Midian, and you're going to get revenge on them for what they've done. They put together the army. They put together an elite team, an elite team of 12,000 men. And they invaded a country, and the Bible said they killed every Midianite man. They took all the spoils of war, which, according to the Bible, was unbelievable. These people were very well off. They took the spoils of war. They took the women and children as captive. They go back to report to Moses. They tell him all this. Moses takes one look at those women, and he is furious. you got to read what he said. Chapter 31, verse 15 through 16, Moses looked at those soldiers and they were so proud of their accomplishments. He said, why did you let all the women live? He demanded, these are the very ones who followed Balaam's advice and caused the people of Israel to rebel against the Lord at Mount Peor. They are the ones who caused the plague to strike God's people. Did you catch it? The sexual immorality and idolatry of the Israelite men was no coincidence. It was strategic. Now, you guys hang with me. You hanging with me? It was strategic. Balaam obviously had a change of heart. He couldn't just walk away from the money. So he obviously returned. And presented to Balak an idea. If you can't curse them, perhaps you could corrupt them. And if you corrupt them, perhaps they will curse themselves. Genius. His idea worked like a charm. And think about it, after all the big talk, Balaam sold out and disobeyed God. He was no longer bought in because he had been bought off. Balaam compromised so that he capitalized on an opportunity for personal profit. He caved in so that he could cash in. Now back to my question for you. If you aren't bought in, could it be that the reason is you've been bought off? You say, Ronnie, I, I have never met nor do I know a man named Balak. I know that. But you have a personal enemy who's much more shrewd and persistent than Balak ever was. Your enemy is the devil, and I believe that he will attempt to buy you off to keep you from buying in. Now, why do you believe that? I want you to look at Matthew chapter 4 with me. We're going to read three verses. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. Here's what I believe. I believe just like Balak tried to buy off Balaam, the devil tries to buy us off. I'll pay you well if you just don't buy into this lifestyle of obedience. Now, let me set the stage. We're going to read a few verses, and here's what's going on. Jesus is getting ready to launch his earthly ministry. He's already gone down to the Jordan River and met a guy named John the Baptist, and he said, John, I want you to baptize me. And John looked at Jesus and said, what? Me baptize you? Don't you think uh, we need to revert a role reversal here, and you need to baptize me? And this is what Jesus said. I have got to do everything I'm supposed to do. I have got to fulfill everything God wants me to do, and he wants me to do this, so I'm going to do it. Sounds like he was bought in. Am I right? After his baptism, the Bible said the Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness where he was going to be 
tested by the enemy. And you know how the enemy tested him? He tempted him. There was the first temptation, Jesus resisted it. He passed the test. There was the second temptation, Jesus resisted it, passed the test. Then you come to temptation number three, and it's the one we're interested in. Look at verse number eight. Next, the devil took him, speaking of Jesus, to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. Listen to this. I'll give it to you. Do you see this? This is the prince of darkness talking to the prince of peace. He shows him the kingdom of the worlds and all their splendor. I'll give you this. I'll give it all to you, he said, if you'll kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Resist the temptation, pass the test. Now let me give you the Hodge paraphrase of what the devil just said to Jesus. Since you are the Messiah, right? I mean, the long-awaited, much-anticipated king of the Jews, why don't you forget about dying? Why don't you forget about dying on a cross? Why don't you forget about this whole resurrection? Why don't you forget about all of that? Just go straight to the throne. You go straight straight to the throne. I'll make it worth your while. Jesus refused. You know why? That would have been an act of disobedience. You say, isn't he the king? He's the king of kings. But it would have been an act of disobedience for Jesus because... Uh, listen, he didn't come as king on that first go round. He came as a lamb to die as a sacrifice. God sent him into the world to die on a cross. That's what God wanted him to do. The devil was trying to get Jesus to disobey God. How? By buying him off. The devil showed Jesus the kingdom of this world and made him a deal. I'll give you everything you see if you'll disobey God. Disobey God and I'll reward you handsomely. The devil tried to buy Jesus off. And here it is, guys. You're the devil tried to buy Jesus off. And if he tried it with him, you can rest assured he's going to try it with you. He'll make you this deal. If you do less of what God wants, I'll give you more of what you want. If you do less of what God wants, I'll give you more of what you want. He'll make us this promise. If you'll back off on your commitment to God, I'll give you more time, money, possession, success, popularity, pleasure, etc., whatever you want. I got a question. We're right back to this question. If you're not bought into a lifestyle of obedience to God, could it be that you've been bought off? Have you made that deal? I know what you're thinking. Ronnie, (laughs) you know, uh, if I had made a deal with the devil, don't you think I'd know it? You know, contrary to what Johnny Ringo told Curly Bill in Tombstone, (laughs) when he leaned over and said, I made the deal. He knew, huh? Contrary to what Tommy Johnson told Delmar and the boys on Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, right? When he said, oh, I made the deal so I can learn how to play this here guitar, right? Most people who take the deal aren't aware of it. When the devil came to Jesus, he was himself. No masquerade, no disguise. When the devil comes to us with the deal, you can bet on it. He is well disguised. Huh? If you're looking for horns coming out of the head or a pitchfork in his hand, honey, he ain't dressing like that to deal with you. And that makes it tough for us to know when we've taken the deal. Another thing is, the devil's bribes, at first glance, always look exactly like God's blessings. I'm telling you. 
The devil's bribes at first glance always, always look just like one of God's blessings. So therefore, it is very difficult, very difficult to recognize when you've taken the deal. But you and I better recognize, and I'll tell you why, that if you've taken the deal from the devil, you're dealing with a crook. He is a liar, a thief, and a murderer. And I don't care what he promised you. He never lives up to his end of the bargain. You know what happened, old Balaam? You know what the Bible tells us? He didn't go back home to his van down by the river. He didn't do that. You know why? He had money. He had means. You know where he set up shop? Midian. You know what? I believe he sported around in the finest chariot money could buy. Had a Midianite woman on either arm. He was set for life. It's nothing but easy street for me now. I cashed the big check. When the Israelites invaded Midian, you know what happened to Balaam? They killed him. His prosperity was short-lived. I'm guessing that was in the fine print of the contract. Correct? Here's what I'm saying. It, 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 it behooves us. Where that word came from, I have no idea. I don't use that in normal conversation. <laughs> Behoove. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's the old Baptist preacher coming at me there. Behoove. It would behoove us. But We better look at ourselves and our lives closely. If we're not bought in, we better figure out if it's because we've been bought off. Because we're dealing with a master deceiver. I don't like being deceived, do you? I can remember the first time I was ever deceived. It left such a bad taste in my mouth. I remember it. You, you know when it was? I was in the first grade. You go, Ronnie Hodge, you couldn't remember when you was in the first grade. Well, yeah, we rode a mule 30 miles one way, <laughs> warmed ourselves by a lump coal fire, carved our answers one times one equals in a, in a stump. Yeah, yeah, I, I get it. I'm old. I see what you're saying. I remember it. It was Easter. You say, this dude's telling the truth. Oh, yeah, I remember it. You know why? I was deceived. We had an Easter egg hunt. And so they'd hid all, hidden all these eggs, and they said, you gave us a basket of people. Go find them. Those kids were quick, man. Quick. Next thing I knew, all the eggs had been gathered up. You know how many I found? Sure, I didn't find one. I'm walking around. The, all I got is that green, fluffy grass in my basket. I felt like a fool. I'm, who's the loser here? I didn't find an egg. I mean, other, some kids had eggs heaping up. They were quick. So this kid came to me. Oh, he was the devil. He had this one egg in his basket, and it had been stepped on. He said, you didn't find an egg? I said, no, I didn't find an egg. He said, man, you want my egg? I'm sitting there thinking, well, then he'd look like the fool. At least I found an egg, right? I said, yeah, I'll take that egg. He gave me the egg. So at least I, it's a smushed egg, but it's one egg, and he's got nothing. <laughs> look, at, look at this room. He didn't find one egg. So they gather us all around. It's a... They said, we've got a prize for the one who found the most eggs. So some kid went up there with a, he got this giant chocolate rabbit. Melt in your mouth, milk chocolate rabbit. Then I thought, well, good for him. Then she said, we're going to give a prize to the one who found the least I'm starting to smell a rat, man. <laughs> the kid kind of cut his eyes at me. I thought, I'll kill you. If, 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 this, if this goes down the way I think it's going down, I'm going to kill you. He looked at me. She said, is there anybody here who did not find any eggs? He's going. 
she pulls out the same giant chocolate rabbit and gave it to this deceitful, cunning, devilish kid. He got the rabbit, walked off, grinning at me. I'm stuck with a crushed egg. That should have been my rabbit. I can't even look at a chocolate rabbit today. I'm telling you, it bothers me. He deceived me. He knew. Somebody tipped him off. You know why you don't deal with the devil? You'll take a crushed egg and be glad to have it. And the whole time, he's cheating you out of the chocolate rabbit. Huh? Here's what I'm saying. He'll give you enough good to pacify you. And somewhere down the line, when the rewards are being handed out at the throne of Jesus Christ, you'll realize he took me for a ride. He cheated me. So where do we go from here? Well, I'm going to go to CVS and see if they got any chocolate rabbits. I, I've got to. <laughs> that's where I'm headed. Where do we go from here? We've got a big question on the table. And I, I certainly don't have time to get into it. How do you know? How would I know that I've taken the deal? How would I know? I'm going to try my best to answer that for you next week. And if you realize, uh-oh, then I'm going to show you what I think we need to do if we're currently doing business with him. So let's pray together. God, this is what we want. We want to live right. We want to please you. And Lord, if there's anything preventing that from happening, you show us. You give us the wisdom to identify and the courage to deal with it so that in a few weeks we walk out of a church service here we're bought in and we live that way for the rest of our days in the name of Jesus we pray together amen thank you you are dismissed